Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Junior Doan, and welcome to Junior Doan's The Spark. I'm so thrilled to be here today because I'm at the studio of Jennifer Clifford Danner, a renowned artist, and she is going to talk to us about her approach to the creative process. So Jennifer, thank you so much for having me Thanks and doing this. Me. I appreciate this so much. Say something about this portrait and how it came to be what it is. Um, this is a portrait of a British comedian, um, Don French, and it, she's somebody who I've known for a number of years. Um, she went to school with me briefly, <laughs> and so we've been friends for a long time. And she was visiting New York, and while she was here, we talked about doing a portrait, um, and she came back for a photo shoot and discussion about life and what's going on. That's sort of how I begin thinking about the process. Um, and I take the photographs and then choose one that I feel really captures the inner spirit of the person, the peace inside. Um, I don't like sort of the smiling pose. I like to capture an unguarded moment. Um, so you can get to know who, who the person is. Um, and I, yeah, I decided to do a very large scale because she's a big personality and I had the freedom um, to do whatever size I wanted to. That's basically how so I work. So when you meet a person that you're going to do, you have a sense of their sort of interior space, mm -hmm. their reflective side. Well, I, I feel like that's really important to get um, a handle on before you begin. So it can have the intimacy and clarity that, that you need to... The private person, as yeah, it were. and have the personality kind of come through. And then you would take a series of photographs. Mm -hmm. And I do drawings from the photographs, um, and then scale them up, like in this case. Um, when I'm working so large, often I'll put it up and then I do have to work on the floor and back and forth um, and you know so you can get the perspective and distance. And you work in watercolor which is hard to control. I, I've worked in oil and watercolor but mm -hmm. in the last number of years I've been doing mostly watercolor um, paintings and portraits. Um, it is hard to control and there's no going back so you yeah. have to kind of plan and be really prepared when you're working. Like, do you vary the paper? I do, yeah, because the paper has different absorptive qualities depending on if it's cold press or hot press, it's um, how much sizing is in it, and that varies the absorption of the pigment. So uh, you probably knew you were using, going to use blue here. Mm -hmm. Blue is a intense, well, can be an intense color, and one of your favorites, too. <laughs> and uh, so you would pick the paper, but already have envisioned the colors mm -hmm. that you had planned to use. Yeah. And then how do you, uh, or what, what consideration would you go, uh, give to, per, to perspective, by which I mean how close versus from bus stop I think it's just an intuitive sense that I have of what works. And that's where the drawings come in um, yes. to get an idea of um, what composition is um, most aesthetically pleasing. Have you found that keeping the face close to the background um, more effective than changing the skin color in any way um, that's more of a contrast? You mean keeping the 
face lighter in yes. color. Yes, yes. Um, I think I, I like the graphic simplicity of how that works. Um, I, I think I'm just drawn to that. Uh, when I, I look at your work, I, I see the emotion first, I get mm -hmm. the emotion, and then I get form. Mm -hmm. It's really, and then I go back to the eyes. It's like a, a, a travelogue. Right. <laughs> to some extent. Now, vanity aside, you did one for me. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so we're briefly going to show that and say, this was an earlier one, mm -hmm. and of course this is more recent. Right. And maybe you'd say a little bit something about how your technique evolved, changed, or by, by just because of different personalities. Right. You wanted to do something different. Right. Or contrast. Um, well, in your case, I think we, um, I really enjoy painting um, the accessories and the clothing, and we had a lot of fun picking out what would work really well um, for for your portrait. So you had this fabulous red <laughs> evening dress that's um, all pleated, and it was hard, but so much fun to paint. It was. It's hard because it had the details and so the so much detail and so so many folds, so much going on. And um, I made the decision to um, change the dress a little bit from the way it actually was, which is more of the intense red here. And I liked the delicacy um, that was forming as, uh, as I was painting the watercolor. And I decided to keep the contrast because I thought it was really interesting, just as a sort of its own abstraction. Um, and all the pieces of jewelry were worked together really well, and I um, I ended up using gold leaf um, oh, for really? for your bracelet. Where you pointed that out? Oh yeah. my goodness, three dimensional. So it makes it pop out yes, more. Yes, it does. It's just a little bit different, um, and I just wanted to keep the the delicacy and lightness that that I felt emanated from you. So talk to me about what was your sense of me, the spiritual sense or the personality if you care to. Um, when we were doing the or when I first met you really or first started this with you. Well, I think there's just a sense of joy as a joie de vivre that you have in particular that a lot of people don't have and I the excitement for life and um, the fun of the experience was uh -huh. really important. Um, so that's kind of where I was coming from that I wanted to carry through. And also just, you've lived an amazing life and I f wanted to capture the presence of that. Um, well, I appreciate <laughs> your kind words. But since this was done later than the earlier one, what in your technique might have changed or in your perspective? I think just allowing a creative playfulness to happen. Because sometimes when I'm doing commission portraits, I have, I put it upon myself like a, what I think the client is expecting it to be. Yes. And you very were natural. very much giving me the freedom to, um, yes. to do whatever I wanted. Yes. And so that was wonderful. Well, um, good. And you have done pictures of children, pictures of families. Right. Would you yeah. care to show us one? Yeah, I'm going to show you one that's um, Charlie in progress. Um, not quite. Just for everybody, this is Jennifer's son, <laughs> the boss. <laughs> one of her sons, Charlie. This is a mother and her two children, and in this case, they're a very close-knit family, and I was trying to capture that incredible warmth and intimacy that I felt as I was um, photographing them. There was, uh, it was unusual, so I decided to go with a pose where they were all holding each other. Um, and there's like an enormous loyalty, connection, and energy between them all. The son's shirt, it was a tie-dye shirt, kind of orange, and I decided to make it 
a little more interesting, more referencing some of my giant jellyfish watercolor sea life pictures. And there's a lot of pattern going on. And there's such similarity in expression and in their eyes just because of their relationships. And in addition to the portraits, you have done things that come out of nature and the sea. Right. I've always loved the ocean. This piece right here is sort of an immersive ocean wall um, piece. And I've also done large jellyfish watercolors on deconstructing the organic forms into more abstractions. I have I did a more conceptual piece using um, deconstructed horseshoe crabs and um, plastic netting that's called Meditations on the Immortality of Plastic. So it's, they're lying beneath the ocean panels. And so it's sort of about how the oceans are um, changing and pollution. And then also I've been working with them in ceramics and paper making. So I thought maybe I could show you the process of working with the handmade paper. Um, Please do. Which uh, we sort of um, begin with with doing drawings um, in the, in this, and then making stencils from the drawings. Um, like you can see the horseshoe crab. And these are made out of? Stencil here. These are um, a type of mylar. So they're really flexible, flexible and they can handle. And use a sharp knife? The, yeah, an X-Acto knife to cut them out. Um, so I, when I'm in a paper making studio, is a wet studio, so I can't do it here. Um, I go to Diodene Paper Mill, which is in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And that um, work with collaborators, because it's a whole specialty to um, work in handmade paper. So they'll prepare the pulp for me. I'll give them my palette. And um, we'll start from there. I have to have somewhat of a plan yeah. of what I'm going to be doing, um, especially if I'm doing large scale works, because we need to get more people to help heft the heavy screens. But um, so what exactly, let me understand more, more so, precisely. This would go to the paper people. So I'd, I'd go in with all my stencils. Yes. Like a, just a variety of them. And they'd pull me a sheet of paper, say. Um, and I would, uh, the paper's wet when it comes, um, so I can, kind of give you a bit of an idea, um, just maybe I should use a smaller sheet. Well, it doesn't matter. Um, if you, so it's, the paper's all wet. I can use different kinds of um, paper pigmented paper to paint. In this case, I'll just use my um, watercolor just to give you an idea. And it, um, the water, it's interesting, the um, watercolor is so related to the uh, pulp painting because it's all wet. <laughs> yeah. And letting the water kind of do its own thing. Um, so I'll have prepared that and then take my, um, my seaweed that I've collected. I have a lot of specimens and seaweed has to be dried carefully and then I would um, rehydrate it which I did with this, and then place it, um, place it as I, you know, think looks interesting. In a bigger um, piece of paper, you can have whole huge specimens laid out, as I can show you later. They'll pull another sheet of um, 
paper that's um, thin abaca and place it on top so it's layered. And then they'll pull a third sheet for me, um, which say will be just white because I've been choosing white. It could be any color. And you'll, I'll place the stencils on as I would like to. And then we'll use um, a spray hose to <laughs> wet down the pulp. So all that's remaining is your pulp underneath your stencil form on the screen. And then that will be placed on, so this would be on top of your pulp, and it will be placed on the piece of paper. Would they be cut out? Mm. Oh, no. No, they use mm. water to remove the negative space. Oh, interesting. And so in the um, final product, something like this. Oh, is that beautiful? Um, in this case, I used uh, an abaca base, so it's, it's sort of translucent. I see that. And what gives the feeling of the translucency? Well, this, um, this paper is the abaca plant as opposed to cotton or something like that, so it's, it's thinner and it uh -oh. allows the light to come through. Yes, I see what you mean. And that's when I, um, I sort of got the idea to put some of these pieces Beautiful. in light boxes so they're glowing and you can sort of see the movement of the water. In this piece, you can really see the bleeding of the, from the iron that's inside the hmm. seaweed, which some people think is interesting and others don't really care for it. But um, it's a very organic and I think... If you put it in a light box, does the heat change it in any way? If you... No, because now we have the LED lights, so they, don't, they aren't hot. So that's great. That I mean, is great. Yeah. Um, is there a fading problem or a, uh, a deterioration problem? I, I don't, I've used the UV plexiglass which protects it from the sunlight and I haven't had any sort of fading problem so far from, from the LED lights. I don't think it's an issue. Now would you use these as part of a bigger um, yeah, I work? just actually did a really large scale work that um, was, uh, I had a concept to do a really big octopus, which um, I sort Ooh. of did some sketches and I decided to, it's sort of a small scale, but do it in six panels that are 40 by 60, so the total piece measures 120 by 120. That's exciting. Yeah, so I ended up, I had to do, um, map out a huge drawing, and then do the stencils for the octopus and the other sea life that was going to be floating around in my imagery. And I um, used the embedding seaweed technique as well, so it had really good specimens that were inside the piece. And I have it here, it's um, ready to go to the frame or to be put in a six light boxes, so it's kind of a big project. I'm excited about it because I think the scale's really oh. gonna be powerful and you'll really, it's very immersive. And in this case, in my first piece, uh, octopus piece, I decided not to use pigment. So it's all natural, um, neutral coloring. So, from your point of view, is there an ideal distance from which to experience this really big work? I think getting a, at least probably 15 to 20 <laughs> feet away is probably ideal. But I think just being next to it also has an immersion experience when you're there. So, it, it varies. It's, um, it's like this piece. It's actually. Yes, it had a multiplier effect in the bigger. Size. To yes. This, uh, if not the same size. It looks like this would be bigger, no? no Maybe not. These are, these are 40 by 60, mm -hmm. six 40 by 60 panels. It's sort of the same concept where you feel like you're underwater and you're among the sea life. And I have, 
I have the concept of doing an immersive room. Oh, um, tell us about know, that. I don't know where the immersive room went, but I, I did a little small scale. Oh, thank you, Charlie. Box of this, so you'd you'd sort of walk in. Can you all and see be this? inside this? This is my little Let scale <laughs> dummy. And then um, I was going to do a larger sculptural piece inside that was kind of related to my um, some of the ceramics I've been doing. So it would, it would be a meditative room. I see that. Yeah. Yes. So we have it on its side right now, but this would be the ceiling, which I would would use uh, more of light sculpture, mm. and then work with sound as well. And the floor would be covered in some kind of plexi, so you could walk on it. Oh, that's so something to kind of down like that. And you mentioned ceramics. Yeah, I um. See, I have. I've been. Um, Working recently with the um, horseshoe crabs, and I've done almost like a Trajan's tower, um, large, larger. Oh, piece. this is beautiful. This is a more of a wall piece that I did, and I have a whole number of them, so they kind of work well with the paper pieces interplaying on the wall when you hang them together. Um, but the lately I've been doing some more sculptural pieces. This is kind of a sketch of the horseshoe crab tower. And then I had a... Um, now would this be zeros. kind of a vase? Do you see it as cylindrical? It's more, and, it's, or you see it as a um, more flat? More of a, it's more... Oh, it says column. Yeah, so, it's, it's like a... Yes. More vase like in shape. I think. Oh, Shall I, I show this to all of you? Don't you love her handwriting? Yeah, it's, it's right I have now. I know how to draw in life. In the bisque. But this, it's about this tall, so it's, um, this is the green where it hasn't even been bisqued yet. But, um, so I'm sort of continuing on with the concept and. Um, what what is with this? These. This is a platter, also incorporating the horseshoe crab forms. I had in the other room. I have a finished platter that's all more shells and oyster shells and scallop shells. And what appeals to you about the horseshoe crab? Well, it's a living fossil. I mean, that's is it the, the shape. Um, I think it's 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 ancient. Um, it's not, you know, people are afraid of them. I kind of grew up living with them and in the Cape and um, but they mm. they've they were used to be so many and there aren't any more and so I I just feel like they're this gentle ancient creature that's been around for, you know, millions of years. Are they on the bottom or mm -hmm. do they they yeah. s they're, they mud crawl. They mud know. crawl <laughs> mm -hmm. near shore. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's interesting that you have uh, uh, a little one. So you work really across um, some disciplines by way of focus and by way of experience. Mm -hmm. The people and their feelings and the sea and what that gives you by way of experience. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the, um, the paintings I've done of all the jellyfish creatures are portraits essentially and then abstracting from that so I just try to be free to explore structure in organic form that is interesting and beautiful kind of pulling out the truth and the beauty and well the one thing nature. I notice is that there are arcs mm -hmm. they're not necessarily rectilinear <laughs> right <laughs> they're sort of nature forms right Anyway, Jennifer, I really want to thank you for being part of the program today and sharing your wonderful art and your process oh, thank you. uh, with us and um, to know that there's beauty everywhere and yes. that you can transform that.
through the human experience and perception. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot to know. So I hope everybody will bring that creative experience to your own life and that you will transform your daily awarenesses into something good and useful and happy. And remember, do something kind for someone you know and someone you don't know and do it every day. And remember to live the creative life. It's so much fun. <laughs> See you next time. Thank you. To contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones The Spark. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.